welcome, folks. This is Alan Cave from uh, Folks Like Them. I'm back with uh, Chip Hardy uh, and Rod Lewis. Rod's the owner of the 515 Production Studio in Nashville, Tennessee, and Chip is the producer and also the studio manager. We've already talked about uh, the work demo in a pre-production meeting, and we're going to tackle the recording session uh, in this in this segment. Um, first question, either one of you can take it. Can the writer be there in person? If not, can they Skype in or FaceTime or some other means to uh, be on the session? Absolutely. Yes. If they can be in there in person, that's great. But if yeah. they're there in person, Rod, what do you ex what do they usually do? I mean, I know what it is, but tell, why don't they you tell them? The couch. <laughs> no, <laughs> no uh, you know, if they, if they want to sing and we prefer, they'll sing a scratch. Uh, they'll listen to the work tape with the musicians if they have any suggestions that we haven't talked about in pre-production. Or musicians, a lot of times, will ask the writer, "Hey, what about this? You think this is a good idea?" Mm -hmm. Then me and Chip will go. That's a horrible idea. No, <laughs> no I'm, you know it's 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 so much fun. I think for the writer to be in there and just you know be around it and see the creativity and and know that hey, you wrote that and these cats are digging on it and and you right. know and playing you know the hell out of it. Right, they are. <laughs> well, and 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 they do. The band does like to have that. That vocal, they do like to be hearing that vocal when uh, you know when they're recording the song. So there's something to be said <laughs> for that too. Uh, I mean, they they take copious notes on their charts that their music that they are reading uh, as to where the singer is singing and where they're not, so they can do their little musical fills and hooks and things. But uh, but yeah, Skype or FaceTime or. Uh, we certainly do like to have the writer or the artist, wh wh whichever it is, uh, present one way or another, either in person or by Skype or FaceTime or something. Well, I'll bounce off. Go ahead, Ron. I was just going to say the Skype isn't perfect, but at least you're there to get enough, you know, feel of the song, the tempo. And, and you know, you still get to see and listen to the band work. So it, it's a good second. I mean, I wish well, it were better, but it's what we got. So. <laughs> well, what you were saying, Rod, about the uh, band, you know, getting them involved. I know when I'm there recording, uh, I know that Tim Grogan, who Chip interviewed, uh, that, you know, we put up on the Folks Like Them site and that it's on the 515 site. Tim, sometimes he'll look up at me and say, well, I hear this in halftime, this section, Alan. What do you think? And I'm inclined to go along with what he hears. You know, I'll just say, yeah, if you hear it in halftime, give it a shot, you know, because that would be a nice change in the song and create interest. Absolutely. And again, that's that, that collaboration thing. You know, yeah. let, let these dudes do what they do. And I guarantee you 9.9 .9 out of 10, you're going to be pleasantly surprised and overwhelmed with what these cats come up with. Well, these guys are making music every day and they're listening uh, to, to what's current every day. And right. they're, they're going to go to what's the most commercial uh, and bring their skill to that table making it that way. And it probably isn't to Rod, but it is to me. Every time we walk out of there after doing a session, I'm scratching my head going, man, did we just record six songs? And were they not flipping great? <laughs> and it's always amazing to me what these guys do. Sometimes it's a very commercial country song or commercial pop song. And then, you know, maybe a different writer wants an actual 60s or Alan and Chris will come up with, oh, we want it to be reggae, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to live that down, am I? <laughs> different songs, or we've done funk for you guys and blues and all, you know, you're doing six songs in three hours and they're all, you know, very individual recordings. And it, you know, the amazing thing is these dudes are so good that they can just flip a switch and it sounds authentic, you know, to that style that genre that's the one thing that always impresses me because chip and i will write the chart he'll do the scratch i'll do the final chart and you know i've got riffs written out the tempo at the top of the chart and everything and and we're looking at each other going boy i hope these cats can pull it off and they always do man it's always uh, just amazing you know one of the questions i wanted to ask it's like 
We set that tempo in pre-production, and I know that lots of times Chip will have the band play a few bars of the song, and I'm even if I'm at home go- going along with it with the lyric sheet, you're pretty flexible. I know that you do change the tempo if we feel like it's a little slow or a little fast, uh, and so that's kind of an important thing to me to sit there with the lyric and sing through as you're playing if I'm not there singing the scratch to make sure that it tempo-wise it feels good. So. That's true, because once we record that track and they start fixing it, that tempo cannot be changed. So, you know, if that tempo is going to be changed, it has to be changed before we do the final recording of that song that we're going to be doing overdubbing to and that the singer is going to be singing to. Oh, Uh, you guys keep me in the loop during that time, like the overdub times. Talk about the... You know, after the initial tracking of like four or five musicians, usually five at least, and and then usually what six. happens? Six, six people actually. Yeah. So what happens during the? Uh, uh, you know, you're sitting there listening, and and Chip says, "Well, we're overdubbing now." What's that mean? I mean, what what's happening then? Well, typically to to fill the tracks out, <clears throat> we'll, you know, we'll cut with bass, drums. Uh, a keyboard sound, an electric guitar, an acoustic guitar, uh, and a utility player who's either playing uh, steel guitar or dobro or uh, sometimes second electric guitar. And after that, to fill it out, uh, we probably will add overdub, uh, another keyboard, another electric guitar, probably another acoustic guitar, um, to add ear candy and, and, and to make to make the track thicker, to make it sound more like uh, a record, which is right. what, you know, which is the way they make records. They'll cut a basic four piece, five piece track and then come back and layer it with other guitars and other keyboards and other percussion things and uh, to to make it to make it interesting and to make it sound like a record. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the things that you know I was like kind of shocked about when I first started working with you guys a long time ago was that your approach to that like um, you're always saying that Chip you're always saying well now let's make Alan's record or Alan and Chris's record or you know and the philosophy always struck me as kind of making this song like way way above what a people would think was a demo we do not call them demos right uh, because we we feel like with the care that we give them from the initial work demo writing the scratch chart the pre-pro meeting and getting in with the caliber of musicians that we use we feel like that they are above uh, what you're going to get if you just hire a band and say, and and there are some of the A string players out there <clears throat> that occasionally will do a demo, uh, but I've heard them say, hey, it's only a demo, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I've I've heard it too. Yeah, and, and that we any musician any musician that has ever said that uh, when I was recording has not been booked on another session. I don't care who they are or how good they are. Rod, do you have anything to say about that? Chip and I have always agreed on that. And I've heard a lot of musicians and, you know, we have a little list. (laughs) Not to be sound mean or anything, but I mean, there are so many great players here in Nashville that, you know, we don't want somebody that's just going to bring that that energy and vibe to one of our sessions, you know? Right. it's it's fun, and all of our guys have so much fun doing it. They love doing this, you know. It's just people like that just don't quite get it, you know. Well, coming back from the writer's standpoint, I think that's one of the most impressive things uh, for Chris and I, and me especially since I've been doing it longer, is that the attitude of everyone is so... They're just trying to make the, the song that they, they have, that just the very best it can be, and... It shows when I get it back, you know, I'm dancing around the house, listening to it, playing it in the car, just can't believe it's what I sent, you know, in the first place. And knowing that it's when I'm on a pitch to the industry that I that's the one thing they might not like the song. You know, they might be looking for something entirely different, 
but the production of the song constantly gets complimented and I get asked where the demos were made and it, and and that is something that I don't have to worry about when I'm pitching or playing it for someone. Again, it's always up to people whether they like your music or not but that production is so good that I, don't, I certainly don't have to worry about that and that's a huge weight off of a writer's uh, shoulders when they're pitching you know? yeah, absolutely yeah you don't want that to be the reason no you know, that maybe somebody doesn't like your song right yeah. and it comes from everything you said before you know in the other sessions about making sure it's uh, radio ready making sure that the length of the song is kind of like if you're after a commercial thing that it's going to work there and th those are the things that become important whether the writer really realizes that or not in the beginning they will realize it eventually they will eventually yeah yeah i, I want to talk about one one last thing here in in the recording session and that is the amount of time that we actually have to spend on a song with the band uh, it's like rod mentioned a while ago we will do six songs. Sometimes we do five, but most of the time we do six songs in three hours. And just do your math in your head, that's 30 minutes a song. Right. So that's all the more reason that in that pre-production meeting that we get through everything that has to do with intros, turnarounds, outros, arrangements, solo links, all that stuff because there is no time when we're sitting in there with six musicians out in the studio recording a song there's no time to break it all down again and change stuff that's correct it, it goes by fast and, and again it's amazing that in 20 minutes they can record this track and spend the last six or seven minutes on it putting other parts on and and filling it out it's just amazing to me how they do that. But that's something that everybody needs to understand. You know, we, we can't spend 45 minutes or an hour on a track. I'll wrap it up with one last little question for Rod, which he actually talked about earlier. And that's that I noticed that <clears throat> if I send a song in with a, it's got some sort of guitar riff or something that you're pretty sure you don't want the band to have to work out. I noticed, I know that you will write that out for them sometimes in a section so that we're not spending time during the recording session with them having to listen to that and, and cop it off the demo or something. That's right, because it's right in front of them. They can go in and usually they'll rehearse it in their chair for a minute while everybody's kind of, and then they have it. But it's written there so they know when to play it. Or you know. on occasion, on occasion, I know, like if it's something more complicated, you guys have sent the song to the band in advance, too. We have, and, and uh, you know, occasionally we'll do that, not because the musician can't play it, right. but it will save us time once exactly. we... You know, once once we get in there, because time is of the essence. Once we get six people sitting out there ready to record, <clears throat> we got we got to push the record button and know that it's going down the way that we talked about. And one last thing, maybe this will be the last thing, but one of the things that I always I took from you guys about sessions was, and you've said it to me many times, it's like, they're like racehorses in the gate, ready to play. And if yep. you let them go, just give them a little guidance, they'll give you everything they have. But if you make them wait there too long with things that you keep bumping or saying, well, could you change this? Could you change that? And having all those things just ready to go for them to play, it just makes a world of difference when they're ready to play, man, they play. And it's awesome, you know? Yeah. There's a, there's a spontaneity that you cannot get back. Uh, once, once they play a track more than two or three times, the, that spontaneity goes away. And right. it may be more perfect, but it's not going to be, it's not going to have that feel, that flavor, that, that pizzazz to it that right. makes that special track. So yeah. I, I wish I could get that you know, across to people that first come in to work with you because it, it's made such a huge difference on the songs over the years. That intensity and that enthusiasm that they play with. Well, guys, I uh, it's been great. That's going to wrap up the recording session part. Next thing that we'll get to is actually working with the uh, singer that you've chosen. Okay, we're going to end this session right here. Thanks, Chip. Rod, appreciate it, man. Thank you, Al. Well, See you.